Okay, so Tim asked me to start today by talking about um, how I bought five complexes in, in 90 days. Um, and so first of all, who already bought uh, some apartment complexes? Anybody out there? Mine is in and out. In and out? Oh. oh, I thought you were talking about in and out of apartment complexes. <laughs> in and out of deals. Yeah. Let's <laughs> try. This way and see. All right, is that, is that doing better, guys? All right. Yeah, because I've got apartment complexes that I've been in and out of. You know, some, some I've bought and some I've sold. And, and I, have, I, I tend to have seller's remorse. Every time I sell a complex, I think, ah, I wish I still had that. But um, I want to bring you back a little bit in history. When I started out, you know, I, I, got, I, uh, I want you all to know when I started investing, my first house was a little $22,000 two-bedroom, one-bath house. You know, so I, want to, I don't want anyone in the room to think, oh, he probably started with big money and that's what he's doing. Because I've met guys that come out of corporate world and they say, well, I've got a million dollars to invest. How can I do that? Well, well like, that's fantastic for those of you all that are in those shoes. But a lot of us aren't, right? And so when I started, it was $1,000 down on my first little house and uh, learning how to rehab it. And bought a second little house that was three bedrooms for sixty thousand dollars. And then my first, my third deal was a, a, a duplex over uh, off of Westheimer, and um, that was one hundred twenty thousand dollars. And I remember when I bought that one hundred twenty thousand dollar duplex, uh, I actually had a friend of mine from high school say, "Man, did someone die and leave you a lot of money in your will?" And I was like, "Are you kidding me? What? No, no one left me no money in a will." And and uh, but just to give you an idea, that to them in those days, that was considered. Oh my gosh, this guy must have a lot of money, you know. And but it, it's all in our mindset, right? We're we're having our our existing circumstances with its uh, barriers telling us what we're capable of and we're not capable of. And and so what I've really had to do over and over again is is overcome my own limiting beliefs. Growing up, a kid in El Paso, Texas, with uh, the old uh, depression mentality. Uh, my, my parents were always penny, penny pinching, and they always uh, would say, uh, "If only we could make ends meet." Have you ever heard that saying? Who's heard that? Well, I became a real estate investor in my mind when I was seven years old. Um, my sisters were were crying. I had two older sisters. Uh, I was seven. They were like ten and um, thirteen. And I walked up, hey, what's going on, Rosie, Romy, what's up? Oh, mom and dad are arguing again about not being able to make ends meet. And, and I've always wanted to be, a, I've always been a problem solver, which is I, why I went into engineering uh, initially. So I said, at seven years old, I said, I got this. We can solve this. Look, let's all get our money together, and we'll run out the back door. Down, two blocks down was a Piggly Wiggly. And I said, let's run down to Piggly Wiggly, and we'll buy some of that ends meat. Let's get some of that meat, and that way mom and dad will start, stop fighting, you know? And, and uh, my kids, my sister started laughing. I'm like, ah, you're such a dummy. They're not talking about meat. They're talking about money. You know, I was like, oh. And I remember in that moment saying, okay, well, then I'll figure that out, you know? And, and honest to God, about that point, I started reading all I could about making money, which is really kind of sad when you think about a seven-year-old reading those kind of books. But uh, all through high school, I, I, as a kid, I would see kids... I would see men, in those days, if you had a lot of money, you had a Cadillac, right? Mm -hmm. right. You know, nowadays, Cadillacs are not, not what they meant to be back in those days, but you were a movie star or you were a multimillionaire if you had a Cadillac. So as a kid, every time we'd go to the mall, I'd see a man get out of a Cadillac, and I would run up to him. Like, I'd freak out if my kids did this now, but I would run up to him, and I'd say, hey, mister, what do you do to be able to have that Cadillac? And they would say, uh, oh, well, I've got my own business. You've got to work for yourself, or you'll never get really where you want to be. Oh, okay, well, what do you do? Oh, well, I've got a jewelry store, and I've got some rental properties. You know, but you figure out what you want to do, son, but always do your own thing. Okay. I'd run into another man. How'd you get that Cadillac? What do you do, sir? I'm in business for myself. You know, I have real estate. And so, I mean, thank goodness those guys didn't tell me I, I sell drugs, because I would have, you know, like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's how you do it. You know? I, was, I was lucky. That everybody I asked said real estate, so I said okay. So that's what I started learning, you know. Um, so that's a little bit of background, just so you guys can appreciate when I share what what I'm sharing. 
because it, it comes from very humble beginnings. And, and one of my biggest mantras is be grateful, uh, be thankful for your, your blessings and uh, don't complain about your, your troubles. Uh, count, your, count your blessings, not your troubles. Count your blessings, not your troubles. That's what I repeat in my mind, you know, as I start thinking, God, I can't believe this is happening. Well, hang on, let's look at all the things that are working right now. And it keeps you driving. Well, it's interesting, we had fun playing some of that music we were playing because uh, I had my first opportunity dealing with a wholesaler. Now, how many of y'all are already wholesaling? A good percentage of you. So I had my first opportunity to deal with a wholesaler. A guy gave me a call and he said, I've got this 21 unit complex. Um, well, I'll back up a step before that. Um, I ran into a wholesaler at a meeting and I said, you know, I'm into multifamily deals. And he tells me, uh, I, you know, I run into multifamily deals from time to time, but I just send out my postcards and I'm looking for houses. And when they tell me they have an, a, com a complex to sell, I just say, oh, that's, that's not what I'm looking for. So I, I told him, well, let me show you how to analyze them. And, um, and when you get these kind of numbers that make sense, call me and I'll, I'll look at buying that property. Don't, don't just say I don't buy complexes. Tell them, let me get the numbers. So within a week, of giving him my calculations, he calls me and says, Chewy, I've got a 21 flex and it matches your numbers. You gotta come take a look. So we went and we looked at it and it was a, a wonderful man from Pakistan that was um, selling his complex. He'd owned it for many, many years. He had it free and clear. And um, he, he wanted uh, like 500,000 for it at the time. So roughly 25 a unit. And I didn't have five hundred thousand dollars, of course. And um, the the first step I want you to really, really get is remember when I said as a kid, it was all about problem solving. You know, really, we're all problem solvers here to make money. We're not chasing money. I think we're we're really looking at how to solve problems for people. And so I was so fortunate. I asked the guy, "Well, what's going on? How come you're selling this? Um, it seemed like a pretty good property." Well, he shares with me that uh, his daughter's about to get married and he's short on cash because uh, these weddings are pretty huge in that culture, right? They go, it's a big deal and they go on for days and he was short on money and, uh, and he was really stressed out about it. As you can imagine, it's his daughter. He wants an amazing wedding for his daughter and I, and I was starting to feel from like, oh man, you know, if that was my daughter, what would I be doing? And so I asked him, well, how much do you need for your your daughter's wedding. And he goes, well, it's, it's quite a bit, but I'm, I'm short 25,000. And uh, I said, okay, well, look. And my mind wasn't on the complex anymore. My mind said, all right, sir, you know what? Let me, what if I help you with 25,000 for your daughter's wedding? And then, and then the owner finance me the rest. I mean, you, you really don't care about the owner. Like then you, you don't have a bunch of capital that you're gonna have to reinvest or you don't have to pay capital gains taxes. You'll, you'll have this nice annuity where I'll pay you monthly. And uh, he was an older gentleman and he said, oh, annuities, that sounds good. So remember that note, you guys, a lot of times owner financing sounds bad to people. Owner financing, I don't know if I want owner financing. Well, flip the word to, wouldn't you like an annuity? Because um, that's all an annuity is, right? A payment you get every month, but but investment bankers and, and uh, Merrill Lynch kind of guys have everybody talked into buying things that give you annuities. So they they'll go, oh yeah, I remember that Merrill Lynch guy talked about an annuity. Yeah, I like an annuity. So bottom line is, he sold me this complex, twenty five thousand down, and uh, owner financed the rest, which was bless you, which was an amazing opportunity for me, right? Who would who would like an opportunity like that? Like just. If, if you had the 25000 of course, and if you didn't, you run out and find it, you know, go borrow it. But, um, so then it gets better. We, wrote, we do the paperwork and it's basically a 6%, you know, 30 year amortization, a balloon in five years. Actually, he said a uh, balloon in 10 years. So, I said, okay, I'm happy with that. Well, about a month later, he comes to me and says, Chewy, I'm still short five thousand dollars for my daughter's wedding. We paid everything off, and I'm still short five thousand. Can, can I please borrow five thousand dollars from you? And I'm like, I just paid you twenty five thousand dollars, and I pulled that together. Like, I don't. How am I going to go find another five thousand? And he says, oh, I really, really need it. You helped me out before. 
And I asked him, well, why don't you just go to a bank, you know, and just go borrow, get a quick note for $5,000. And he explained to me he was Muslim and he couldn't pay interest and his culture didn't allow him to do that. Well, that was new to me at the time. Some of you all have heard that, right? Uh, so, so um, I said, well, okay. Well, I'd love to help you with the $5,000, but hang on. You said you have a problem borrowing money from a bank because you're not supposed to pay interest um, because of the, what it says in the Quran. Well, we just did a note a month ago, and that was 6% note. 30 year amortization, um, 10 year balloon. And he goes, Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I can't sleep at night. I feel like God's going to punish me. I should have never charged you 6%. Can you please help me get out of that problem? I said, Well, yeah, we could go to my real estate attorney. We can write a new note at 0% interest. And he goes, You could do that for me to help me? And I said, Yeah. <laughs> so honestly, honestly, he was so grateful. And it would have never occurred to me to ask for that. I was solving a problem for him. And he literally, literally, he's a beautiful man. He calls me uh, every month and he says, my son, my brother, my brother, my son, let's have lunch. And we go and we have uh, meals together and he's a wonderful man. But I got a 0% note from just caring and connecting with somebody. It would have never happened otherwise. You all get that, right? Um, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on this because real estate, you can Google how to do real estate and you get tons of articles, you know? It, it's, it's really not that big of a deal. What is a big deal is, is our mindset, like really showing up to make a difference. Um, I love what this young lady over here was talking about, about what she's doing in other cultures. Um, Ma'am, what is, what is your name? You said you were doing all that humanitarian work. Manisha. Manisha, Manisha. There's a... Uh, I just want to acknowledge there's a really beautiful thing that I I consider what I do and I'd love for you all to take it on. Uh, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, right? Well, there, there's, a, there's a whole other cool level uh, referred to as social entrepreneurs. Who's heard of social entrepreneurs? Yeah, wh what do you know about being a social entrepreneur? I know I want to end obesity. You want to end obesity? I, I've got a guy that's uh, a doctor that's got a patent on something amazing that I'll, I'll tell you about. Um, the... Um, and I'm waiting to invest in that. It's going to be phenomenal. Well, social entrepreneurs are not just making money like we all want to do as entrepreneurs, but they're making money with, with the mindset of making a difference in our society, making a difference for people. And, and that's all I've ever done. So I want you all to take that on as a, as a possibility of who you're being when you're out there. You know, when you're taking those phone calls, you were sharing with me your great deal that you did, and the lady called you, and, and you, you weren't there going, how much money are you making this deal? You're, you're listening and getting present with her and figuring out a solution, and that's why it worked for you, right? And you had a great closing. Well, um, what I do is I make a difference in communities, one, one property at a time. I buy crackhead properties. I, make, I always like to say I make a lot of money on crack and prostitution because... Uh, that's typically what I target. And people say, well, why don't, why don't you target beautiful neighborhoods with beautiful properties? And I say, well, what's the fun of that? I, I love knowing that I'm going into a place that's really trashed out, last owners haven't been taking care of it. I move out the, tr the troubled people, I clean it up, and then I move in good families. You know, And, and uh, uh, it's very gratifying. And, and I want to emphasize this. A lot of our barriers to um, prosperity our, our thoughts about how somehow it's bad, right? You know, like some, oh, those rich people, rich people are jerks, rich people are arrogant, rich people, you know, there's all these things, and I had them when I was growing up, you know, uh, and, and so it helps me bypass all that. Rather than get rid of that thinking, it helps me bypass that thinking by saying, well, I'm not doing it for me. I'm not doing it just so I could have the latest Lamborghini. I'm doing it because I'm making a difference in these areas. I'm doing it so that I can have uh, my I have an autistic sister. I want to have my sister handled, and I've got a mom with Alzheimer's. I want to have my mom handled, and so I'm doing all this stuff for everybody around me, and then I get to benefit along with it. You know, now it's just my story, but my story is if I was doing it all for me, I don't think I would be doing as well. I don't. It's just 
but that's part of my beliefs. You know, you guys might be able to say, I'm doing it all for me, I'm going to make a lot of money and do great. That's awesome. You don't have the barriers that I have. So, so the, a lot of times we can't change our thinking so much. Don't change the old programming. I just figured out a way to bypass it. Yeah, yeah, that is bad. Okay, but I'm not doing that. I'm doing this other stuff to make a difference. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. Well, I get uh, I get to this 21 plex, and I think, wow, that's 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 bigger than I ever thought I was going to be able to buy when I was uh, buying my first little house. So this 21 plex over here, A, was down down off of Wayside and 610. Well, about a year later, I get a phone call about three other properties, actually two other properties right in the area um, that were for sale. And uh, how many of you all know Jeremy? Jeremy and I, a year before, were trying to buy that property from a lady at 20000 a unit. The lady wanted 25000 a unit, and uh, Jeremy had met her called me, we were looking at buying it, and she would not budge off of 25. And Jeremy and I worked so hard, we both got so depressed because we couldn't get that deal at 20, and we had to walk away from it. Well, a year later, I get a phone call from a banker, hey, we just foreclosed on these complexes, can you take them off our hands, they're at 10,000 a door. The same ones that Jeremy and I had beaten our heads trying to make that woman take 20. And so at that moment, you can imagine, I said, absolutely, sir, I'll, I know those properties, I will take them. So I got them under contract immediately and uh, uh, bought those two right away. And, and then about 60 days later, I had a call from another banker that said, I just heard you bought two REOs off that other banker, I've got another one, um, can you please take a look at this one? And that one was also an REO, super, super cheap. And... Um, uh, but once again, we were trying to solve this lady's problem, um, the lady that, that wouldn't budge off for 25, and we had a solution for her, but she just wouldn't take it. And she ended up going into bankruptcy, and then we ended up benefiting from it later. So at that time, I want you all to know, at that time I thought, I'm a rock star. I just bought three apartment complexes in 60 days. Like, how could that ever happen again? Like, to me, that was just so beyond my, my capability of thinking of what's possible. And, um, and, and that brings to mind this, this cool saying um, of Albert Einstein's. Really, all that changed wasn't anything about what I know about real estate. All that changed were the conditions that, that I had in my mind that were holding me back. You know, um, and, and so when I started shifting the conditions in my mind, I was able to go out and within 90 days, I bought a 22 unit, a 12 unit, a 14 unit, a 6 unit, and a 32 unit. And I, at that point, I thought, wow, I need to sit back and just chill out and focus on my properties. And then about 60 days later, I found a 48 unit that they called me on. And I said, okay, I'll go and buy that one too. And so this was five in 90 days. And then 60 days later, I did the other 48 unit, which, I mean, who would like to be able to do something like that this year? Like... Pretty crazy. I don't know if you'd want to though. All it's a lot of work all at once. But uh, I, I had to surround myself with a great team. I think that's one thing you probably learned a lot this weekend is you don't do this stuff by yourself. Uh, I had to to get myself good managers, good maintenance men. So let's go in deal by deal. The 22 unit it was a foreclosure. Excuse me. Uh, this was all three years ago. Yes, sir. Um, well, the, the early ones before, that was like four years ago, and then these, it's been going through progression here. Um, so there's a 22 unit, it's over there off of Lockwood, and uh, as we're doing this, I'm gonna give you guys some tips on how to find these deals, all right? This was a lender, uh, he finances a lot of complexes. The guy has about literally 1,000 mortgages, and uh, in the past I bought uh, 21 houses from him. When I was just doing houses, I bought about 21 houses from this man. And and he and I have a beautiful relationship because so I got to where I would pay him off. I, I'm really big on being debt free. I, I, I freak out about debt. Um, I, I used to use debt a lot to grow, but now I'm, my goal is to be debt free. So he would, he thought it was really weird that I kept paying off his notes and he liked that compared to everyone else he was having to foreclose on. 
So one day I was going in to make my mortgage payment on one of these houses and he says, Chew, I'm about to foreclose on this guy, but I don't want, here's a great tip. He says, I don't want to own, I'm a lender. I don't want to own this property and I don't want to foreclose on him unless I already know who's going to step in. So will you go take a look at this and see if you want it, then I'll foreclose on him and let you continue on that note. I mean, who, be, who would like an opportunity like that? So what do you think I said? Absolutely. What's the address? Let me run down there. So I ran down there and um, it was, it was, uh, bless you, it was a, up here off of Lockwood, north of 610, uh, north of 10, uh, between 10 and 610. And I used to own 32 houses right uh, by Cashmere, in, up at Cashmere Gardens, right by uh, uh, Barbara Jordan High School. So I knew that area because I used to have those 32 houses, which I, which I sold um, on an owner finance note because I got to where there's a lot of work to cover those 32 houses. So I sold them to a man that loved the opportunity. I passed on the opportunity to him, and then every month I would get those mortgage payments from him. And it was really, really cool because sometimes he'd come to make the mortgage payment and say, man, you know what I just did yesterday? So what? I just had to change a water heater. I was like, oh, thank goodness it was you and not me. You know, it was like, I just, I get the payment and he's doing all the work, right? So I think also it says in the Bible, be the, be the lender, not the borrower, right? You were talking about earlier, um, the Quran. Well, so I told that man I'd take the 22 units when I came back all excited, he says, um, here's the deal. That guy's kind of a jerk. If I'm going to foreclose on his 22 units, I want to take away his 12 units also. Um, he's behind on that one too. He's not, on, he's not as behind on the 12 as he is on the 22, but if we're going to take him to court, let's just knock it all off. So will you take the 12 also if I, if I um, foreclose on that one too? And I said, well, man... How much money do you want down for all that? You know, it's gonna, I'm gonna have a lot of rehab to do. And he says, Look, I know you're gonna have a lot of rehab to do. Just give me 10000 down and I'll owner finance the rest. And that way you can use your money for the rehab. I said, Absolutely, let's do that. You know, so I, I, I got that 12 unit, um, which was up a little further north, but still somewhat in the same vicinity. Now, those 12 units, they're two bedroom, one baths. They're uh, rented for five fifty a month. They're uh, central heat and air. This last guy had put brand new tile cabinets. The, this guy was behind on his payments, but he was remodeling this place. It looked it looked better than anything I had owned up to that point. So I was really really happy to have had that opportunity. So once again, I was not being an investor trying to go buy a deal. I was trying to solve this man's problem. And say this 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 guy was really frustrated because. He kept having to hear excuses from, from this gentleman. Um, so, so right after I bought those, brokers that I know started saying, God, you, you're, you're really getting active in this apartment thing. Said, yeah, well, um, so I, I found this 14 flex on LoopNet, and I called the guy, and, and he says, well, I've got a few offers, but I know you've closed on several deals. If you make an offer, I'll tell them to take your offer over the other guys because you're, you're a proven closer. And, and that's something you guys all want to get to, where you're known as proven closers, right? Um, there's deals that I've been lower on than other people, but they say, take Chewy's offer because he's not gonna, he's not gonna be a jerk and go in there and do inspections and uh, try to use that inspection report to bring the price down. You know, I, I go in and I look at it, everything real fast and I decide, okay, yeah, it's probably got uh, asbestos. It's probably got this, it's probably got that. I already, Assume everything before I make the price, and and then I don't I don't go in with that bad intention of like the bait and switch, right? Treat people the way you want to be treated. You don't want someone to do a bait and switch on you. Here's what I'm going to give you. Oh, by the way, I got a discount for this. Like if it happens um, legitimately, that's that's one thing. But a lot of people do that as a as a tactic, and and I I, I really discourage you all from doing that. Uh, so. I didn't have the money for this, and I went out. The lady said she would give me owner financing. Um, I believe this was about 20 a door, so it was about $280,000. And she would give me owner financing for 200000 and she wanted eighty down. So uh, how many of y'all have been learning about private lenders? Well, we all know 
private lending. Well, I'm going to give you a little, a little bit of a, some words of wisdom as we go along. This isn't just about telling you about the deals. I'm, my, my goal is to share the lessons. Every deal, every day I'm learning. I tell my kids, as long as we're breathing, we should be learning. Well, I learned, I learned a tough lesson on this one. Um, I went to a guy, uh, actually a guy came to me at an investor meeting, and he says, uh, hey, my mom's really getting old, and she could use an annuity, and um, I was wondering if, if uh, you could help because she's only making 1% or 2% on her money. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, next time I have a deal, uh, I can, I'll give your mom 6%, that's 300% more than she's making if she's at 2%. He goes, wow, that would be great. So this deal came up and I called him. Hey, guess what? Um, I've got an opportunity for your mom to put $80,000 at 6%. Um, it's better than your mom's money making one two 2%. And he says, that would be fantastic. So I showed him my contract. And here's here's the warning, guys. This, this, is, this is a big one. Um, this one really, really caused a lot of stress and a lot of these gray hairs. Um, when the guy saw it was what I was doing, he says, oh, well you're buying this 14 plex. That looks like a heck of a deal. I, I don't know if I want my mom to just make 6%. You know, I think she should make more than that if you're gonna get to buy that complex with my mom's money. He's like, well what happened to you? Hey, 300% more would be great. And I said, well, okay, fine. You know, I really wanted the deal. I said, okay, fine, I'll give you 8%. How's that? Uh, I don't know if that's good enough. You know, maybe let's do 10%. Well, I had a very short window to close this deal. So, in my ignorance and my scarcity thinking, I was like, man, okay, I need this. Let's just make it happen, right? In hindsight, you guys, you start, you start seeing that. That's what I would call just someone being greedy, right? Someone being greedy, I mean, do we really want to work with those kind of people? You know, that's, the, honest to God, from now on, if that ever happens to me, I'll just go, oh, you know, thanks, I understand you want more, that's just not a fit for me, let me, let me go to somebody else. And there's more people, you know, to talk to. I wasn't thinking like that, so I don't want you to make the same mistakes I made. It gets worse. I said, okay, let me go with 10%, fine, let's get the thing closed. Now, I've got from 6 to 8 to 10, and the guy goes, wow. You know, we're just going to get interest payments, and and then when you sell it, you're going to have all this back end money that you're going to make on the equity, and we want some of that equity. We don't want to just be lenders; we want to be partners. Oh my God, are you serious? Now at this point, it's like three days before the closing. I'm going, darn it. Well, then that saying, "Half of something's better than all of nothing," kicks in, right? That something's better than all or nothing. So I'm like, fine, let's do it. And um, so we go in and we do the deal. And I'm I'm disappointed because I really wanted that. Everything I buy, I buy with the sake uh, with the thought of passing on to my children. You know, I'm a long-term holding guy for the most part. So I'm thinking, oh man, this one I'm not going to go pass on to my kids. It's all messed up with this guy as a partner. Um, uh, and I was struggling about whether to do it. And, and then the lady, the lady owned three complexes right right together right there. And the lady says, if you're gonna buy, if you're gonna buy that one, I've got a, I've got a six unit across the street and another 20 unit down the street. Uh, why don't you all just buy all three? And at that point I thought, well, let's look at the numbers. Uh, the numbers made sense on two of the three. The third one she wanted way too much for what could cash flow. So, so we just added the six unit to the deal. And at that point, I thought, okay, we're getting 20 units all together there. Uh, that was going to take another 20,000 down. So now I was looking at 100,000 down. And the guy said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you all the down payment money. Let's do the deal. Well, the crazy thing is, as, <laughs> as luck would have it, as I'm trying to decide whether or not to sign my life away to this guy that's now turned into kind of a jerk, um, I get I get a phone call from another lender that says, hey, Chewy, I hear you're really active about buying foreclosures right now, and you're closing, and you're a proven closer. I got a 32 unit. You want it? And um, I said, well, where is it? You know, so so he, 
Can you tell me where it is? And this is now uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's, that's the fifth one. And this is right by Palm Center. Y'all know where Palm Center is? Griggs, MLK. Um, huge. Uh, this pro this property was a huge drug property, uh, but it was it was it was a uh, right along where the, the the metro rail was about to go through, which is now done. Um, but at that point, this guy says, well, I'll give you the down payment money for that one, too. No, actually, that one had to be cash. He said, I'll give you all the cash for that one. So then I thought, okay, now this guy's at least now, he's, he's uh, worth having around. You know, at this point, we got this 32 unit for $320,000, 10000 a unit, which, by the way, just last month, I sold it for double that. But at that time, it was 320000 a unit. And so he put 320000 down, plus the 80, plus the 20. So that was 420. I thought, all right, well, this guy, at least, if he wants to be half my partner, at least he's coughing up 420000 That's all right. So, you know, it all, it all kind of worked out. Um, but now here's back to the lesson about why we would not do this again. It, it, um, all of these deals are profitable. They've all, this one, uh, we sold it, made an extra uh, 100 grand each. Uh, there's, they're, all, they're all profitable, but, but they weren't worth the heartache of dealing with this greedy guy. You know, it's just, I, I wouldn't do that all over again. I want to warn you guys. Um, when, when, um, so I, I, I'm not going to make this presentation all sound like it's all, Perfect. It was fantastic, but I'm learning. I'm learning. I want you all to always learn too. And um, what happened there was we, we moved out all the all the um, drug dealers. Did a lot of evictions. Had the police in there. Called 911 a lot. Had a lot of guys with guns, and uh, it was it was a really rough place. A lot of pit bulls, and <laughs> so we got them out of there. And I I come up with the idea of well let's let's turn this into a senior citizen home. You know, let's just make it 55 and over. That way we don't have these young guys coming, uh, you know, with tattoos on their faces. And it was just really, really tough. Uh, I've, I've been around a lot of those kind of zones, but this one was one of the worst. Um, so I make it a 55 and over community, start slowly moving in seniors. And those wonderful partners of mine <laughs> that I ended up buying this with start saying, this is going too slow. Let's just let normal people in. It's like, no, guys, this normal people was what we had in there before. This, they, you know, well, we just get white collar people in there. Like, well, white collar people are going to move right here, right now, the way this neighborhood is. No, it's not going to happen. So the guy tells me, well, I, I, I was a home builder in Georgia, and I made, I built a BB King's house, and I've done multi million dollar houses, and I've built houses for stars. I know what I'm talking about. You know, you're just this young guy. Uh, I'll, I'll let you learn from me. So, you know, there I am, always wanting to learn. And I said, you know, I don't always have all the answers. Oh, I never have all the answers. I said, you know what, if there's a better way, okay. You know, and, and, and uh, so that was, that was another bit of wisdom. I sat there and I, I gave away my power, you know, from what I knew I knew. Because this guy was telling me he's building million dollar deals and deals for B.B. King, which I'm a musician, so I'm like, hey, that's kind of cool. You know, so I'm thinking, that's wonderful. But building, building million dollar deals is not the same as landlording in low income neighborhoods, right? So they said, we're going we're gonna to manage it. We're going to start to fill it up. And, and we're gonna, let me show you how it's done, son. I'm like, okay. All the same people start coming back in. You know, the, the drug dealers that I get evicted. You know, they sent in their little sweet looking girlfriend and she signs in, you know, and, and I already knew who they all were, so we'd say no to them. And he's like, Oh, see, she's a nurse. Yeah, but she's not the one that's gonna live there. She's signing an application and the guy's gonna go in. And oh, you don't know, you don't know. I'm I'm a multi million dollar builder. You're just little chew from El Paso. Yeah, you know, let me show you how it's done. You know, so within about sixty days it was filled with drug dealers again. And I was my son, this is the beautiful thing. My son says to me, Dad, why would you listen to somebody that doesn't know what you know? I thought, hmm, it's kind of a good point. You know, I, he doesn't know what I know. Now, I don't know everything, but I do know that. 
and I know that he didn't know that, so why did I listen to him when I knew he didn't know? So um, we play these games in our heads, you know, so I grew a lot out of that. It made a lot of money, but I could care less. What I really love about that is how much I grew personally from those experiences. Um, so 60 days later, I get a phone call from a broker. Hey guys, uh, there's this property in the slums down in League City. It's in the hood. It's really trashed out. Chewy, I hear you really like hood properties and you're into the slum stuff. Um, so yeah, I have a reputation as being the mom and pop guy and the guy that likes slum properties. And, 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 I, and I love it because there's a lot of folks that want to buy properties based on ego. You know, I've got a lot of friends uh, that have put deals together and they, they put 20 people together to buy a 200 unit complex. Have you ever heard of those kind of deals? Yeah. I'm a lead investor. I have a 200 unit complex. Well, you, you have it with 20 people. If you do the math, you kind of have 10 plex, right? You know, <laughs> but, and, and, but they'll all tell you, I own a 200 unit complex. They won't say, I own a, I own a 20th of a 200 unit complex. Nobody says that because it doesn't appeal to the ego to say that. So I, I'm okay with people saying, Chewy's just a little mom and pop guy that buys slum property. I'm like, yeah, that's good. But I know in my heart, I'm transforming these neighborhoods and I'm making a difference. I'm providing safe, clean housing for people. And it's profitable for my family, my kids. Um, so I, I go down this 48 plex. How many of y'all know League City? Do y'all know that there's a real bad slum hood part of League City? No, right? Well, Ship Channel, but that's not really League City. Right. Well, I didn't see that one. But overall, <laughs> overall, it's kind of a trick question. There is no slum hood in League City. I mean, it's. I went down there and I, I passed by this property and I said, it can't be that one. And I'm looking around and at the corner of the block, there's a, a Mercedes-Benz dealership. Across from that, uh, there's a ballet studio. It's like right by Highway 3 and there's a McDonald's and, and um, Starbucks at 518 and Highway 3. I'm thinking, this is slums? Well, this is the slum of the city, but compared to the slums we're used to in Houston, this was like beautiful. And... Um, so I, I was thrilled. Like this is actually pretty great. Well, the lady wanted six hundred fifty thousand. So I thought, well, okay. My my mo is try to buy as close to ten, and then try to have it be worth as much as twenty a door. So twenty a door would have been nine sixty. Ten a door would have been four eighty. She's at six fifty. I'm like, okay, there's some room in there to make some money. And I put on my problem solving hat. So if you guys remember anything from my talk, just remember to be problem solvers. Um, I talked to the lady. Fortunately, the broker knows me real well. Uh, and the broker, some brokers don't want you to talk to their clients. But this broker knows me and he kind of like said, Chewy, go work your magic. Go talk to the lady. She'll probably like you and you work out a deal. So I sat down with the lady and I said, what's, what's a... What's the reason you're selling this? And she goes, oh, this is just the slums of my portfolio. And I said, well, really? And, well, she owned a, a 200 unit complex right by the Galleria, which was worth tons of money. And she owned a 200 unit complex on the seawall in Galveston, which is worth tons of money. So relative to her stuff, this was the worst of her properties. And she just said, um, I've got a deal on my ranch. I have an opportunity to buy 300 head of cattle, but I need this money right away for my for my cattle that I really want to buy. Okay. And I thought she was lying. Was, You're selling this complex to go buy cattle? And she goes, yeah, yeah, I am. So um, I asked her, well, how much money do you need for that cattle? And she goes, well, I need... I need about $180,000 by Friday, because if I don't pay the guy Friday, and this is a Monday, I told the, uh, he, uh, she says, if I don't have $180,000 by Friday, I'm going to lose the cattle deal, and, and my neighboring ranch is going to buy them. And so, so now my mind's on the complex, and I'm like, okay, well, how much is that per head of cattle? And tell me all about it, and I'm learning all about her ranch. And she's ex explaining to me how many thousands of cattle she already owns, and she really wants these because these are some special Brahma bull mix or something that I don't understand. And they were some special cattle. It was a great deal. So I said, okay, well, 
We need this by Friday. Yeah, this is a Monday. You know, if I can give you that hundred eighty thousand dollars by Friday, um, I'll I'll make that happen, but not at six fifty. Let's. I'll go with ten a door, which is four eighty, and um, uh, and I'll I'll help you buy your cattle by Friday. And now, her the broker said, yeah, but we've already got an offer from Lifestyles, an offer from this other guy, and all these other offers were. 600 plus, but they all wanted 60 days to close. And she said, can you trust Chewy? And he goes, yeah, I've known Chewy for a long time. If he says he could close by Friday, he could close by Friday. So she says, I'll take your 480 over those other people's 650, and I want my cattle Friday. <laughs> so isn't that beautiful? I was like, wow. And, and, and it, it felt so good to be acknowledged for my integrity was really what it was, right? Like. They said, he said, he's not going to go in there and try to change the price on you after inspections. He's not going to go in there and have excuses. And the lady goes, well, how do I know you're going to really close on Friday? So here's a cool trick. Um, I said, I'll tell you what. I'll close in 24 hours. Just close in 24 hours. Just do the deal. Sign it. So she goes, all right. So we signed it. Close in 24 hours. Well, before I said that, I asked, has the title policy been done? Uh, no, we haven't worked on title policy yet. So, okay, I'll close in 24 hours. So we signed the papers, and they said, we're going to go open title. Okay. Well, how many of y'all have ever been to a title company? How many, how many people get their clear title in 24 hours? How long does it take y'all? Three or four days. Maybe a week. Maybe two weeks. So now... The lady's not waiting on me. She's calling the title company. Come on, hurry up, hurry up. We need our title. Come on. So uh, it was awesome because it, it enabled me to be the good guy, promising that I'm going to show up with her money. But during the time that I was waiting for the title to be done, I ran in there with all my guys, did all my inspections, made sure everything was fine, and uh, got myself ready to take it over. And... Uh, so I went back and I thought about those rich guys that really ticked me off on those last three deals. And I said, I'm not going to do that again. And I thought about this guy that used to be a property manager of mine. And he became a roofer. He, he and I started a roofing company, but you had to get up at 5 in the morning. And I don't like to do that, so I let him have the company. And uh, I, he was an awesome guy, so I, he, he had remodeled 32 houses for me that I made uh, $320,000 on. And this guy had done it all, like one man machine. So, oh, Rogelio. You guys remember Rogelio? Any of you saw that last Rogelio? Uh, for those of you saw the last panel, he was my roofer, my manager. I helped him go buy 21 houses of his own. And uh, he's very grateful to me. So I called him. I said, Rogelio, I got a deal. Um, I need 180 grand really fast. And, and if I'm going to help make money with anybody, I want it to be you. And how much money do you have right now? And he says, well, my cousin's got about 250 grand right now that he wants to invest. Um, and I told him all about you, and he asked me to let him know when he ever had an opportunity. So he said, so well, call your cousin. He called his cousin, and his cousin said, heck, yeah, I've got cash. It's all, and I was like, it's cash. He's like, yeah, it's all cash, like bills. So, <laughs> okay. So... So we went to the closing, and he came with a briefcase full of cash, and I didn't ask any questions. I was like, I was like, I'm happy. I'm happy you got your 180. But, and this guy was a flooring guy. This is a man, his cousin is a man, on his knees. How many of y'all done ceramic work? I mean, you sit there like this all day long, putting the mortar down, putting the grout. You know, these guys work hard. And... I was able to take that guy's 180. We made a partnership where he was the money guy. Rogelio was the guy to do the make readies. And then I was the, the businessman that put it together. We filled it up, put it up for sale. And we sold it for double what we got it for. We sold it for 600000 more than what we bought it for. And each of us made 200000 The tile guy that works like crazy... 
got to make $200,000, which to me is just amazing because it's just, he deserves it. You know, my roofer guy that has to be out there in the heat, waking up at 5 a.m., taking bundles up on the top of roofs with his children. My kids would never do that. He's out there with his kids, and uh, it was so beautiful. I mean, I, I, was, I was in tears when uh, we gave him the money, and, and I thought, wow. Like those are the kind of people I want you all to think of doing business with. People that you're going to be able to celebrate together. People that are going to go, wow, we're making a difference in each other's lives. And, and that's, that's what I call the social entrepreneurship part. You know, it's, it's not just about making money. Actually, making, uh, making money is... i got to be careful when I say this, but to be honest with you, making money to me is a byproduct. It's not what I'm after. It's a byproduct. What I'm... And, and I don't mean that literally, of course, you've got to make money, but it's not my sole mission, you know? And so I'm out there, it's about making a difference for people, it's about keeping my word, uh, doing things right, doing things long term, having, having, uh, having the freedom to enjoy my life with my family is the real thing I'm up to. I'm not up to having a lot of money, and, and I'm, I'm working on changing that. Tim's, Tim's helping me change that. Because <laughs> I've seen these guys. Like they're really they're doing great and and they're uh, uh, yeah. I wanted to add to that. You know, it's it's not about making money or making a difference, right? It's the, the, a lot of us have an or conversation. Yes, I'll either make a lot of money or I'll volunteer and make a huge difference. Well, really, like what Chewy show you here is an and conversation. Yes, I get to make a difference and make a mo and make money at the same time. Right, yeah. so it's a lot of what we do. So, like exactly. when you're out there talking to sellers, talking to buyers, like, look, you you're not just making money off of this deal. You you are really providing a solution to this homeowner. You're really providing a solution to these buyers and these private lenders. Yeah. And so always have that in mind. It's an end conversation, not an or conversation. Yeah. And he he helped me see that because he saw me stumbling about. Man, when I was a kid, you know, I went to Austin High School, and everyone talked about the jerk kids at the rich high school, Coronado, and you know they're gonna to talk bad about the, the kids at the rich school and so there's a part of me that was really conflicted you know like wow I'm getting more and more successful and like my bell tower deal you know that made millions and, and it's like I didn't set out to make millions I set out to make a difference you know and uh, so it started to freak me out a little bit so he's helping me get get that clear in my mind it's like hey you can do both right so are you all okay with doing both yes. who's okay with doing both let's see all right, well, y'all are ahead of me, so that's good. I was, I mean, I'm there now, but you're ahead of me from where I started. So, um, so this is that, I'm going to get to your question in a second. So, um, there's a reason I share this. Um, you'll ever watch magicians, and you think, that's amazing, how the heck did that guy do that, right? And then, um, when I was a kid, I always loved getting a little magic trick. Kits at Kmart back in those days, and uh, but then you learn the trick and you go, that's all there is to it. That was no, that was no big deal. Have you all ever who's ever done that with a magician? You see the magic trick, how it works, and you're like, oh, that was no big deal. Well, it's no, it, it was a big deal when your thinking was where it was. Then you learn how it worked, and you're not thinking that way anymore. Now it's oh, it's, it's simple. Well. Most of what I do, this is really funny because it'll it'll mess with your all's egos. Um, most of what I do, when people see what I did, they're like, "That's obvious. That was so easy. Why didn't we do that?" And um, and what you'll find is you're going to be helping people that are having problems. And and you'll think, "Well, why don't they just do this? That would solve all their problems." But you got to remember. It's their thinking that got them into that problem. So they don't see it, right? You, you show up fresh with different thinking and, and you see something that's obvious because you're not using the same thinking that they're using when they got in that problem. Okay, let me see, does that make sense? Let me see if that made sense to anybody. Uh, it makes sense in my mind, I don't know if it made sense when it came out of my mouth, but <laughs> yeah, you don't get what I mean? So the reason I say that is everybody in here has 
different thinking than the person next to you, right? Is there anyone that has the same thinking as the person next to them? No. If there is, that's kind of weird. I don't want to know about it. All right. What are you thinking? You're supposed to know. Especially husband and wife, you're supposed to know what each other's thinking, right? Men and women, they're supposed to know. Well, so here's, here's the deal. The reason that's really empowering, the reason it's really, really empowering is there's no excuse for any one of you to think that you don't have the solutions to somebody's problem, okay? I want to repeat that. None of you in this room have an excuse for thinking that you don't have the solution to help somebody, all right? Because you've already got a different set of thinking than they are. And, and, and it's their thinking that got them in that problem. It doesn't matter how much more education they have, doesn't matter how much more money they have, they're, they're clouded inside of their circumstances. And you're showing up fresh, and it's, it's beautiful every time you can show up fresh and make a difference for somebody, and they're like, ah, thank you, that was really great. You know, so that's, that's what you all have in you naturally, just, I mean, don't believe me, believe Albert Einstein, right? He's, he's a pretty believable guy. Right, so, so that that wraps it up. What I want to let you know is is that's really all we're about. If you focus on that, you're gonna have this. You're gonna have this made. And uh, I personally kind of like this guy's stories. Right now, I'm looking at a deal that has to do with investing and in helping obese people, and a deal that has to do with investing and in getting things into space cheaper. And uh, it's really exciting that I'm doing, and, and I'm also working with the heart doctor that's got a new uh, artificial heart pump and and uh, I'm surrounding myself with amazing people that I never knew I could know in my life you know like this guy that that's one of my best buddies that he uh, he's done a TED talk he's been on Time magazine and he's like called me to, hey let's hang out and he shows me the animals that he puts these fake hearts into artificial hearts into and and it's it's an honor to get to be around these people and, and, and take my money and invest in things that are making a difference for people's lives. And uh, so this thing can grow beyond your expectations. You know, it's, it's, it's grown beyond mine. And, um, and I, I particularly like this picture because I want to share with you the thought, the thought about the Statue of Liberty back there. And I got about a minute and a half to go, so we're doing great. Setting this just on time. Um, remember I said earlier, what I'm up to is, is freedom, more so, you know, freedom of my time. And uh, literally yesterday, I, uh, no, today's Sunday, so take that back. Literally Friday, I, uh, I flew to Boise because my mom's now in a nursing home, a uh, 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 place for people with autism, uh, Alzheimer's. And um, I was talking to my mom Thursday night. And she said, oh, I really, really miss you. When are you going to come? I really, really miss you. And it was just breaking my heart. I'm like, ah. Oh. And then my son had a cross-country, his first cross-country meet of the year yesterday morning. So I thought, golly, if I go see my mom, I don't want to miss my son's cross-country meet. What am I going to do? And I just, you know what the heck? Fly up there, spend the day with my mom, fly back at night, get to my son's meet in the morning, and just, I mean, you can have it all. You know, and, and. If I was still working my 85 job, could I have done that? It's like, no. Um, the week before that, my sister, who's autistic, uh, was having problems. And I thought I was going to go up there for a couple days to take her to the doctor, try to figure out what's going on. Something was off with her meds. So I left the week before on a Friday. And I realized things were worse than I had realized, that I had assumed they were. So I ended up being there one full week with her, Friday to Friday. And it just was just, that's just like kind of what my world looks like. It's like really cool. Okay, I had to be there. Weekend turned into a week. Okay, no biggie. It's just, that's why I have my rental properties. That's why I have my managers to collect the rents. That's why I have my guys doing their make readies. You know, and like that to me is uh, priceless. That's, that's the stuff that's priceless. And, and a lot of you all know, when, a couple years ago when my dad was dying, I, I took uh, what was supposed to be 48 hours, he was supposed to die in 48 hours. They said, fly home, he's about to die. And so I was, dropped everything. And those 48 hours, he got better and worse and better and worse. And it became four months of him in and out of the hospital. And I was with him those four months. And I would 
fly home just if my son had a cross country meet and he's like the fastest in the state. He's like really amazing. So I never wanted to miss his, his meets. Um, and, and then my daughter, she's really into performing music and, uh, theater. So I would come for her performances. I would come for his, um, meets and then I fly right back home to be with my dad because I didn't know when his last day was going to be. And, and then I had my gigs as you all know, I play sax. I've got a couple bands I'm in. And so I'd come fly home for my gigs and then fly right back to be with my dad. Like that's, um, that's amazing, you know, to, to, to me to be able to do that. And that's what I want you all to be able to do. And, uh, and you have it, you have it right in your fingertips and you surround yourself with good people. All the people here, take all the training you can. Read as much as you can. Be a sponge. Uh, I'm always learn learning every day, and and uh, and that's the end of the presentation. So you guys, uh, I want to hear about your all successes as as we go along, and 